Okay, so welcome everyone. We might get started with the event. So thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion. I'm Tess McAvoy. I'm co-director of the New York office and legal counsel at the International Service for Human Rights. Firstly, a brief word on the technical elements of today's event. The event will mostly be in English with some elements in French. You will see that there is a live interpretation available in both English and French. So please select the language of your choice with the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Whether or not you are using interpretation, you need to select the language you'd like to listen to. So whether English or French, otherwise we may understand you may have no sound coming through. We'll also send this through in, a chat, in the chat box to give you instructions on, on how to select your language. And to all speakers, please make sure you select the language you'll be speaking in through the interpretation button as well. We're joined today by some incredible speakers. This includes Mary Lawler, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, Sukhrel Dugasaran from OT Watch Mongolia, Matt Kulabali from the Coalition Ivorian de Defenseurs de Droits Humains, Vincent Laurent from the Switzerland Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, Katerina Rose from the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions, Pablo Romo, the former president of the Consultative Mexican Protection Mechanism for Human Rights Defenders and Journalists, and Felipe Sanchez from OHCHR Rule of Law and Security. We're also joined by Alice Na from the Center for Applied Human Rights, University of York, as well as Hannah Dwyer Smith from Peace Brigades International. I'm going to provide further introduction for each speaker as they intervene. And as we have many speakers and a short period of time, I'm also going to be quite strict on speaking times for interventions. And so I do apologize in advance. Over the past 20 plus years, the international human rights system has developed strong sets of standards, norms, and recommendations for states on the recognition and protection of human rights defenders. Yet while this international framework continues to develop, the most significant protection gap for defenders is implementation at the national level. It's clear that effective implementation requires commitment and coordination by states, monitoring by national human rights institutions and meaningful participation and consultation with defenders. One way in which ISHR, our organization, has been working towards this goal of national implementation is by supporting the strengthening of protections of human rights defenders within national legal frameworks. That includes amending restrictive legislation, as well as supporting the development of national laws for the promotion and protection of defenders. So legal recognition and protection of defenders is crucial to ensuring they can work in a safe, supportive environment and be free from attacks, reprisals and unreasonable restrictions. It also contributes to the broader goals of upholding human rights and promoting democracy, good governance, sustainable development and respect for the rule of law. In the development of laws for the protection of defenders, a protection mechanism is often developed, tasked, among other things, with the implementation of the defender's law. In different national contexts, we have seen this developed as a separate body or housed in existing national human rights institutions. Informed by this, in 2019, ISHR commissioned a study on the desirability and feasibility of a global network of human rights defenders focal points. The study was carried out by the Centre for Applied Human Rights at the University of York, who you will hear from shortly. The study sought to consider the desirability and feasibility of such a network, to gauge the interest of state and civil society actors, and to explore anticipated costs and benefits, and to deepen understanding of whether and how such a network could meaningfully contribute to the implementation of the UN Declaration in diverse national contexts. We'd like to acknowledge and thank Canada for their support in this research project. In today's event, along with York University and with the support of the Swiss FDFA, we are bringing together a range of stakeholders to discuss the study's findings and strategize in the first instance about opportunities to implement, as well as challenges associated with the call to establish a well-functioning national focal point delegations. Momentarily, I'll give the floor to Alice Nahr and Hannah Dwyer Smith, who will speak and present the findings of the study. Alice is a senior lecturer at the Centre for Applied Human Rights and the Department of Politics at the University of York, UK. She conducts research on the security and protection of human rights defenders at risk. 
She's one of the co-authors of the Barcelona Guidelines in Wellbeing and Temporary International Relocation of Human Rights Defenders at Risk. Her edited book, Protecting Human Rights Defenders at Risk, published by Rutledge in 2020, proposes ways in which the protection of defenders at risk should be reimagined and practiced. She is also the chair of the board of Protection International. Hannah has been working in various capacity support defenders since 2013. As a researcher, she has sought to deepen the understanding of the situation facing defenders around the globe, encompassing the security of defenders and the challenges of closing space for civil society. Hannah is currently a training and protection coordinator with PBI's Indonesia project, and she previously worked as a researcher at the Center of Applied Human Rights in York University. Alice and Hannah, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Tess. I'm just going to share a PowerPoint slide with all of you. Um, can you see the slides? Can you see my screen? Okay. So Hannah and I will present this together. Um, we, uh, Hannah and I worked on this research as um, ISHR, um, it, as a project commissioned by ISHR. And we thought we'll take a few minutes just to set out the main findings of the research. Um, you can find the full copy of the report as well as a summary on the ISHR website. Uh, and we'll soon be putting it on our website as well at the Center for Applied Human Rights. So this was a study that we did um, commissioned by ISHR to examine uh, the desirability and feasibility of a global uh, network of human rights defender focal points. So we were um, exploring questions uh, such as whether there was an appetite for a network like this, what would be needed to make it succeed? How could we motivate states to participate in a meaningful way? And what would it, you know, what would make it effective? So we did the research uh, between October to 2018 and February 2019, and there were four of us on that uh, in, in a team, Hannah, myself, Ulysses, and David Meth. We uh, did, did a number of activities. We uh, did a literature review looking at similar networks of national focal points. Uh, we uh, conducted interviews with 54 participants from five countries. We imagined what kind of you know, participation we would expect and want from such a network. And we chose countries uh, in consultation with ISHR that had uh, already displayed a, a level of commitment to realizing the aspirations of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders um, and had uh, activity you know, sort of on the ground, different sorts of political um, and domestic arrangements uh, for the protection of defenders. Um, so we interviewed a range of um, people from uh, civil society governments and MHRIs. And we also interviewed other stakeholders, donors, funders, uh, international NGOs, uh, who are involved uh, transnationally in the protection of human rights defenders at risk. What we found is that there was broad support for uh, the establishment of a global network um, if it could achieve change on the ground for the protection of human rights defenders at risk. So the people we spoke to were a little bit um, tired of networks for the sake of networks or networks that only focused on interstate dialogue. Um, and they wanted a, a network that could really achieve change on the ground. And as a, one of the participants, a commissioner at uh, the NHRI in Indonesia, Komnas Ham, mentioned the real work is at the national level. Um, so we found a number of ver very interesting points and explored some issues through this study that Hannah will now uh, share with you. So thank you, Alice. So to um, dive straight in, one of the main findings that came out of the out of the research was that participants really favoured a multi-stakeholder model for the national focal point, and this differs somewhat from from the existing national focal points that are uh, already set up in other policy areas. Uh, in so much as people really felt that within the the human rights defender and protection. Um, approach, it was really important to have a model in which it's not only a government representative, but also includes the NHRIs and representatives of civil society as well. Um, and this was felt to be necessary, not just for um, driving the defender oriented agenda, so, so specifically kind of keeping 
uh, the focus on the, the real implementation uh, at the domestic level, but also for ensuring accountability and for, for building trust. So I think one thing that came out is that within, uh, within this context, and within civil society, uh, there's a kind of existing level of distrust, which in some contexts is, is somewhat heightened uh, and could provide a barrier. So taking this multi-stakeholder approach uh, offers an opportunity to kind of involve uh, elements of, of, of all of the actors who are involved in protection for human rights defenders and, and keep things really, really relevant, also kind of heightened in terms of the transparency and the accountability. Um, and also kind of including that consultative function as well. Um, also, what we found is that naturally each state has quite a different domestic architecture and, and often already existing architectures around the protection for human rights defenders. Uh, so what was important from the participants' perspective was to ensure that there's not a duplication of efforts that um, where there are existing architectures, those could be used. So certainly taking the Indonesian example, there is uh, interaction and kind of existing, maybe less formalized, but certainly networks that uh, involve civil society, involve the NHRIs and involve government. Uh, representatives and that those can really be kind of capitalized on and that maybe such a global network would be a way to kind of uh, facilitate the strengthening of those existing architectures as well and also kind of to reflect that you know in each state in each context the the, the architectures differ and that needs to be reflected in the in the global network um yeah certainly it was imp important um for the state officials to be involved so for government to be represented um and that there's the opportunity by taking a kind of multi-stakeholder approach or a more a more varied approach than in some global networks to have different and maybe more relevant individuals attending different events being involved in different parts of the uh, of the activities and the work of the of Liti there. Um, and also to come back to this issue of trust, that it's not only trust as an external issue from kind of wider civil society towards the focal point, but also trust within a delegation is critical as well, right? So that the um, each of the actors is able to, to work well and cohesively together um, in order to achieve progress at the domestic level. Okay. Alice, maybe next slide. Um, yeah, so then moving on to the focus of the network. Uh, it was really uh, kind of driven home that it needs to be practical and action and solutions oriented. So with this, uh, people were really keen for it, for, you know, to not just create another talking shop essentially, right? Uh, that, you know, the interstate dialogue is really important and relevant, but at the same time, for the issues facing defenders, they're much more uh, pressing and imminent, right? Um, so yeah, so so there was a real focus on on the improving the implementation being being quite practical. But also, you know, people saw value in creating a kind of peer to peer platform where these different actors could raise an awareness and inform policy decisions between one another, showcase good practice, also develop good practice um, and the kind of network side of, um, of the engagement rather than just at the delegation level, it was key to kind of create safe spaces where you could have um, kind of this multi-stakeholder element where people could interact at, at the different levels, but also to create spaces where, where state actors can speak to state actors, NHRIs can speak to NHRIs, and in that sense kind of have safe spaces where they can really share share the challenges in a very open and trusting way. And then, yeah, one aspect that did come up was with regard to if such a global network were created, um, who would be included? And there, it was also a very strong feeling that it should be quite limited initially to include states that are really already uh, practicing and, and kind of um, implementing good practice uh, 
with regard to developing and strengthening the protections for human rights defenders. Obviously, that should be a very, you know, a diverse space um, and states would be at different positions within their own, you know, kind of progress on those issues. Um, but that, that kind of uh, needs to be key in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, Kind of credibility uh, of the of the network and that it's uh, really holding to a high standard the states that are members um, yeah in order to kind of keep things keep things going and yeah and so this is you know this is about keeping the protection standards high it could serve a function of improving the reputation of states that protect defenders and that's obviously positive um, as well as protecting even the delegates that might participate in the next network but it's also about building collective accountability within and between those different actors right so if we take the multi-stakeholder approach that it's kind of about pushing each actor to be able to um, best implement uh, the declaration at the at the domestic level and creating good practice, not just um, not just sharing what we already know and kind of repeating the same things, but really kind of trying to create quite dynamic spaces where where we could also make progress as well. Um, and something that did came out was that in this kind of multi-stakeholder approach, what would be good would be to include the special rapporteurs of the different internet governmental organizations um, in order to yeah, to, to kind of have their expertise and their guidance and that this could be something like a steering committee or it could be to simply participation within certain events and meetings and, and so on. Um, there were nevertheless some concerns raised. Uh, the issue of politicization, I mean, I think we see this in, in other forums and so I think I don't need to go too far into that. But this idea that, you know, it would be positive for, for states to get reputational benefits. That can be a, a driving force, but only when that's reflecting a reality, right? Uh, it would be um, problematic for sure if, if kind of membership connotes uh, a good practice that isn't actually uh, the case. Um, and within that, we were kind of also quite concerned about how to deal with states that backslide through political change, right? Um, which is something that we're seeing, you know, uh, in various corners of the world at the moment, right? Um, other points that were raised were not to be, that it shouldn't be too dependent on specific committed individuals. And I think this comes back to a benefit of the multi-stakeholder approach is that, you know, when you involve a few more, a few more individuals, a few more organizations, then it may be kind of better maintains uh, momentum when individuals come and go. But at the same time that, you know, that can in itself present a little bit of a challenge in the sense of how, um, yeah, there being enough, uh, not the, the responsibility is not too widely spread, thinly spread, I should say, something like this. And then resources are obviously um, a significant concern, right? Um, so to conclude, because I think I'm probably already over my time, but uh, there was certainly broad-based support for a global network of HRD focal points. There was a lot of value seen in bringing the different stakeholders together and bridging some of those gaps that exist um, within, you know, certain domestic contexts um, and for states who are demonstrating a commitment to improving the protection of human rights defenders to kind of, um, yeah, to be involved, to get further support and to kind of hopefully pull other states along with them. Um, and, and there was a feeling that, th that there could be tangible outcomes and change domestically. And that was really kind of centered as, as the most important point, right? That, that uh, implementing changes and, and improvements for the security and the protection of human rights defenders is really what this comes down to. So not yet another network for dialogue. Um, yeah, with that respect, in that respect, the formation of like these robust delegations were seen as, as, as critical. Um, and that's something that really was felt a need, you know, quite strong 
I won't say grassroots support, but I mean kind of support at the national level, at the level at which it is being built, um, that it's, uh, and also maybe seizing on those kind of organic links that are already there. Um, and that, yeah, this really comes, you know, the kind of success of the thing really comes down to these issues of commitment and trust and transparency, accountability, and always resources. So um, that's a very brief overview of uh, kind of the main themes that came out, but I'm very looking forward to the conversation as we continue. Thank you. Thank you both so much for that, for that summary. And um, before we move on to the discussion of the findings of the study, for, for those of you in the audience, if you have any questions throughout the event, please add them through the Q&A function. We'll be monitoring questions as the event progresses. I'd now like to turn to the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights defenders, Mary Lawler. Mary needs little introduction. She has worked extensively with and on the situation of human rights defenders. Mary is an adjunct professor of business and human rights in the Center for Social Innovation School of Business at Trinity College, Dublin. In 2011, sorry, 2001, she founded and was executive director of Frontline Defenders to concentrate on human rights defenders at risk. And prior to that, Mary was the director of the Irish section of Amnesty International. Mary, as outlined by Anna, Hannah and Alice, the majority of the participants in the study favored a multi-stakeholder model in which delegations would comp comprise representatives of the government, national human rights institutions and civil society. From your perspective as a mandate holder, would you see it as advantageous to have multi-stakeholder focal points at the national level in driving the implementation of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders? And if so, what characteristics do you think must be in place in order to ensure maximum benefit in that regard? Over to you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a, it was it's very interesting to listen to you even so far. So, um, Ideally, yes, of course, anything that helps in implement a declaration is a good thing, but we know we're working with a huge um, range of contexts and we know many governments are antagonistic towards defenders and many countries don't have NHRIs or if they do, often they don't meet, they don't conform to the Paris Principle. But yes, if defenders and states can engage better, then that has to be a good thing. Um, what wouldn't be good is uh, if, as has been said, it ended up as just being a tick boxing exercise. Um, any such project, uh, if it's to come about, has to be entered into seriously by states and others. And what's most often lacking is, is it isn't uh, motivation or even capacity, it's political will and it's persistence. And we know uh, that examples of national protection mechanisms, um, we know from them that initiatives to keep defenders uh, safe have to be properly resourced. So I'd say the required characteristics would be that the focal points are connectors, not gatekeepers between defenders and states and that the projects that sorry that the projects are properly funded and that states enter into these arrangements with the with real political will and and and, and not just as a pure exercise thank so you so much mary that was perfect and so brilliantly within the time limit so thank you so much um, I'd now like to pass on to Sukhadel Dugerson, who is the Executive Director of OT Watch Mongolia. OT Watch Mongolia is an NGO dedicated to monitoring investment in the Oyu Tolgoi mine in South Gobi. An activist since 2006, Sukhadel is also part of the Human Rights Forum of Mongolia, a coalition of national civil society organizations that were critical in the development of the HRD protection law that was recently passed in Mongolia. Sukharal, I'd now like to turn to you. The study we are speaking about today actually builds on a broader piece of research conducted by ISHR in 2018. This research looked at the implementation of the declaration in Colombia and in Tunisia. In that study, an initial question was broached as to whether the designation of national focal points within the executive could assist in encouraging coherence and effectiveness in the implementation of UN resolutions and recommendations on human rights defenders. 
At that time, that idea was met with concerns about whitewashing, that is the use of national focal points for self-promotion above the advancement of protection for defenders. Bearing in mind this critique, this study, this recent study, sought to dig deeper into the opportunities and challenges presented by the establishment of a global network of national defender focal points, which considered alternative models for such a network in light of the experiences and realities in different national contexts. We've also seen the risk of whitewashing in the development of HRD protection laws. Mongolia is a country that has just recently passed a law on human rights defenders. And so we're very interested in hearing from you. From your perspective, as defenders who are integral in the development of the defender protection law, what will be most important to mitigate these risks? Over to you, Sukharad. Okay. Um, thank you uh, very much. And uh, I am very happy to, to see everyone. I uh, will uh, briefly open my video um, just to, for you to see that it's me. <laughs> Um, and then I'll turn it off um, because uh, it gets a little, uh, um, the sound, it gets breaking sound. Um, so moving on to uh, the, um, the question, um, Mongolia's experience in passing a human rights defender law is one that is negative. Um, I'm afraid it cannot, it, it's more uh, of a uh, warning bells uh, to uh, those who, especially in jurisdictions like Mongolia, that are um, affected or hijacked by mining interests, uh, transnational corporate interests. Our work on HRD's protection law since uh, 2018 revealed that the process can be hijacked. We have not been included in most deliberations. We're part in the process only in name, especially when it came closer to uh, the um, discussions uh, in the parliamentary sessions. There were two factors that we have not taken into account, which backfired on us with the approval of this law. It had uh, two harmful provisions. One was a ban on defamation, a uh, ban on, uh, ban on um, damaging business reputation of others. And the second provision is ban on soliciting, receiving, and utilizing resources from cover organizations of intelligence services. And there's a long list of those organizations, but the last one the, from unknown sources is uh, the, uh, the, the most risky one. And these two provisions have been influenced by two separate forces, but ultimately representing same interests. The business lobby in the legislative pr process is very strong in Mongolia. And there is uh, the issue of revolving doors at all levels that enshrine investment friendly climate in every document that is uh, coming out from decision-making levels. Uh, and the second one is the anti-money laundering and terrorist financing um, process, uh, or for sure, for short, you probably heard about FAT, the Financial Action Task Force, um, which enshrines restrictive provisions against nonprofits using receiving financial um, support from uh, various uh, sources uh, for terrorist financing. The whole language in these in their reports and recommendations is talking about 
supposedly protecting nonprofits and including including uh, community groups from uh, terrorist financing. In reality, it turns into provisions like these. Uh, and um, currently, uh, influenced by these uh, fat recommendations, the law on non-governmental, uh, the draft on non-governmental organizations was separated into three different um, pieces of legislation. One on a law on nonprofits, um, the other two law, uh, laws on uh, funds and other financing mechanisms that are non, non non-governmental. And when going back to global network, uh, any mechanisms, uh, multi-stakeholder, so multi-stakeholderism is used by business community to penetrate all public decision-making spaces. And that also has to be taken into account when creating new mechanisms and spaces. Um, I think um, having uh, a global network and starting um, with um, possibly um, stakeholders, countries that are advanced in uh, human rights protection may be a good idea, but it has to be weighed really carefully when we come to uh, the level of uh, jurisdictions that are um, weak, corrupt, uh, strongly influenced by extractive industry, because that could turn essentially the law on uh, HRDs in Mongolia it, uh, can be used against us. I mean, it, it's, it's now created more restrictive space than we had without it. So um, the issue of whitewashing in this case sounds like a almost harmless and natural reaction of politicians. Thank you so Stop much, Karel. Thank you so much for sharing those really, really critical insights and, and bringing forth, you know, we really see a, a, a crossover between ensuring this discussion um, can bring forward kind of the opportunities, but also really bringing to light some of the challenges and, and that we need to keep in mind. So thank you so much for sharing. And now I'd like to, to uh, return to Pablo Romo, who is the former president of the Consultative Mexican Protection Mechanism for Defenders and Journalists. Among a long list of accomplishments, Pablo is a professor at the Claustro de Sor Juana University and UNAM. He is a former member and president of the Civil Council of the Protection Mechanism to Protect Human Rights Defenders and Journalists, as well as a consultant on human rights issues and peace, protection and truth commissions. He currently heads the Casa Rita project in Mexico City and is a fellow of the Oshoka organization. So Pablo, I'm now turning, turning to you. Given that every state has a unique domestic architecture for the protection of defenders, the study found a flexible approach is needed to allow for the participation of diverse relevant institutions, roles and functions within each state. Drawing on experiences in Mexico, how could state and civil society actors coordinate with each other more effectively on the protection of defenders at risk? Do you have examples of positive and negative practices? You're still on mute. Thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. Thank you very much for the possibility to share with you this, uh, our experience here in Mexico. I think uh, uh, it's necessary to share this uh, experience all, all around the world. And um, Mexico has a protection mechanism uh, where the state actors, public human rights bodies and uh, civil society participate. It was founded uh, around uh, closely 10 years ago. And um, after that, uh, the situation of the heart of the threats against the human rights uh, defenders continue. 
how it's possible that uh, that's a good question that's uh, the, the the main question it's not just uh, how you build uh, this mechanism or how the architecture for the protection of human rights defenders are uh, we think here in mexico it's necessary to have more than the mechanism to support uh, the human rights defenders and their work certainly they are necessary it to have a flexible approach to build the, the structure of the mechanism of protection. But, uh, and same in Mexico, it's necessary to, to build it the different the bodies and different uh, structures here because it's a huge country. And uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the architecture uh, for the federal architecture is not enough to, do, to protect them. One positive uh, experience has been uh, a, 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 what uh, I would like to share with you is uh, we had uh, um, the experience to work together with the authorities to build and to create uh, the, the law for protection uh, and the, the law for uh, the protection mechanism. It, that uh, the law uh, that uh, governs uh, the governs the mechanism was elaborated between uh, the civil society and the state's authorities. It is uh, a very good law in in abstract, and uh, the design uh, that uh, we believe could work uh, at the time. Uh, the law provides uh, for. Um, fairly equi equitable decisions making making uh, between the civil society and the state's authorities in fact uh, they uh, they are a committee to take the decisions more or less together but the the, the problem um, this is the the good experience in fact uh, but uh, the negative experience it's uh, day by day year uh, after year we uh, we realize the government wants not uh, to continue support this mechanism and uh, uh, has considerably reduced uh, the budget and in many occasions the protection measures are not the expression are just uh, an expressions of the goodwill but uh, it, it do not truly protect the, the, the defenders and uh, well, this mechanism also protect the, the, the journalists. So uh, we are one of the most uh, dangerous country in all around the world in the sense of uh, the, the, the situation of the journalists, but uh, also in the case of the defenders. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, uh, well, in the last uh, years, we had uh, uh, around 45 uh, uh, defenders killed um we think it's necessary to 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 build this uh, uh, measures of protection of the human rights defenders in the different uh, um uh, contexts and in the different countries and the different regions but certainly the most important is to to continue supporting the standards the international standards of uh, the to defend uh, the human rights defenders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. And thank you so much for bringing the perspective of Mexico, as you say, with a really strong instrument and then kind of looking at the challenges following on from that. I'd now like to turn to, to Matt. Matt Gulabali is the national coordinator of the Ivorian Coalition for Human Rights Defenders and coordinator of the UPR Follow-Up Committee, which is a platform of about 30 civil society organizations involved in the UPR process and treaty bodies. Since 2019, she has been a member of the board of directors of African Defenders Pan-African Network of Human Rights Defenders in charge of the Hub Cities Initiative, which is an initiative to relocate defenders at risk on the African continent. Matt, could, you, could Defender Focal Point provide a space for advocacy to hasten advancement on issues related to human rights defenders domestically? Specifically, do you think that a focal point could bring about positive change in the legislative framework in which defenders are operating in? Uh, 
Merci beaucoup, Tess. J'espère que vous me recevez. Euh, okay. Oui, hey, hey, Merci beaucoup à International Service for Human Rights pour cette opportunité qui est offerte à la coalition euh, d'intervenir sur ce point spécifique. Et euh, j'ai un petit souci de connexion, ma connexion n'est pas très stable. Donc, avec votre permission, euh, je vais désactiver ma, ma vidéo. Euh, de crainte que je sois lâchée par la connexion. Merci. Et donc, concernant euh, les, les points focaux, je voudrais d'abord euh, euh, féliciter euh, International Service for Human Rights pour euh, cette étude euh, merveilleuse qui a été euh, conduite. Et euh, pour ma part, il, il est vraiment intéressant qu'on puisse avoir euh, des points focaux euh, qui, euh, qui prennent déjà en compte les différentes parties prenantes pour la protection des défenseurs des droits humains. Et ça, c'est déjà très bien. Et j'ai vu que l'étude a pris en compte euh, euh, le gouvernement, qui est le premier garant de la protection des défenseurs euh, des droits humains, les INDH et les défenseurs des droits humains eux-mêmes. Euh, concernant le, le cadre législatif, je dirais que oui, je répondrai par l'affirmatif, que euh, les points focaux euh, pourraient euh, apporter une contribution et jouer un rôle euh, dans, le, dans le cadre législatif dans lequel se trouvent euh, les défenseurs des droits humains. Euh, le premier élément euh, pour moi, euh, c'est que les points focaux devaient pouvoir travailler à, à l'élaboration d'une loi euh, de protection des défenseurs des, des droits humains, parce que c'est par là qu'il faut commencer. Euh, de sorte à, euh, à attribuer aux défenseurs des droits humains un cadre légal de leur protection. Et un autre élément, euh, une fois que euh, euh, ce processus, le point focal est mis en place, il est important que le, les points focaux puissent être vraiment impliqués dans toutes les actions euh, de plaidoyer à mener auprès des autorités nationales, notamment les ministères clés, quand je parle de ministère clé, je vais parler du ministère euh, de la Justice et des droits de l'homme, euh, le ministère des Affaires étrangères, les institutions nationales des droits de l'homme et les parlementaires. Et donc, il est important de, de, de travailler à cette action de plaidoyer, de sorte à ce que, avant l'adoption de la loi par les parlementaires, que les préoccupations des défenseurs des droits humains soient prises en compte. Et donc, il y a un travail de, euh, de documents euh, sur un argumentaire qui mettrait en avant euh, les différentes questions pertinentes selon le contexte du pays euh, par rapport à ce cadre légal qui devrait être mis en place. Et euh, l'autre élément concernant toujours ce, ce, ce cadre légal, euh, c'est qu'il faut vraiment une euh, meilleure collaboration avec les, les différentes autorités qui sont là et avec l'expérience que nous avons eue au niveau de la coalition, nous pensons que c'est cette collaboration qui nous a permis vraiment d'être impliqués dans le processus d'adoption de la loi par le plaidoyer auprès des, des, des autorités nationales, par la prise, par la participation aux différentes séances de travail pour l'adoption des avant-projets des lois avant leur adoption à l'Assemblée nationale et par le travail de plaidoyer que nous avons eu à faire auprès des parlementaires. Et, et les parlementaires, ils sont souvent très ouverts, donc il faut en faire des alliés. Euh, et ça pourrait être des alliés sur, pour euh, les points focaux euh, dans le cadre des processus d'adoption de lois pour les défenseurs des droits humains. Et une fois qu'on euh, franchit cette adoption euh, de la loi, il, il est important que les points focaux puissent travailler à l'effectivité de, euh, de, de la mise en œuvre euh, de la loi qui serait adoptée, une loi de protection des défenseurs des droits humains. Le constat que nous faisons, c'est que souvent les lois, elles sont adoptées, mais l'applicabilité pose problème. Et comment faire face à, cette, euh, à ce, ce défi-là euh, de mettre en œuvre efficacement euh, et de façon effective les lois qui sont adoptées C'est de mettre en place des mécanismes de, de protection euh, qui vont euh, faire le suivi de la mise en œuvre effective de la loi. Nous sommes en train de, de, de faire cette expérience de la mise en place du, du mécanisme de protection au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire, parce que nous avons déjà euh, euh, une loi qui a été adoptée en 2014 pour la protection des défenseurs des droits humains et euh, son décret d'application en 2017. 
Et donc, nous sommes dans ce processus de, de mise en place de, du mécanisme de, de protection. Et ce mécanisme-là, nous le voulons euh, proactif, euh, alerte et qu'il soit vraiment indépendant. Et nous avons voulu que ce mécanisme soit porté par l'Institution nationale des droits de l'homme, avec euh, euh, laquelle nous sommes en collaboration. Et tout ce travail, nous sommes en train de le faire avec l'appui technique et financier de l'International Service for, for Human Rights, que nous remercions au passage. Et c'est vraiment un travail que euh, les points focaux devront faire pour garantir l'effectivité euh, des lois de protection des défenseurs des euh, euh, droits humains dans les différents euh, pays, selon les contextes, comme euh, je l'ai dit. Et, euh, et, donc, euh, et donc, voilà, et les défis. Thank les so défis, much, je vais terminer sur ce, ce point, si vous le permettez, en une minute. Si okay. vous le permettez, en une minute rapidement, euh, il est important de par parler de ces défis auxquels nous sommes confrontés malgré l'existence des lois. C'est que euh, il y a des lois qui sont adoptées pour la protection des défenseurs des droits humains, mais en même temps, il y a des textes qui, dont les dispositions sont en contradiction avec les dispositions contenues dans les lois qui confèrent aux défenseurs certains droits. Et c'est le cas au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire, où il y a des décrets qui ont été pris dans le contexte électoral de 2020 pour empêcher les manifestations sur la voie publique. Et euh, une de nos collègues euh, qui avait euh, appelé à manifester pacifi pacifiquement aujourd'hui se retrouve en prison avec ses collègues. Or, c'est un droit qui est reconnu dans la loi. Donc, c'est des défis auxquels les, les points focaux devraient vraiment avoir à l'esprit et voir comment apporter des réponses. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you for bringing that really important perspective. From Côte d'Ivoire. Um, before I pass to Philippe Sanchez, I'm just going to really encourage all speakers, please, to try and uh, commit to the speaking times. We really want to make sure we can get through through all the discussion and questions today. But it's really hard, I understand, because there's so much critical information to bring into this discussion. And I and I thank you all for your for your participation once again. And um, Philippe Sanchez has a long-standing list of credentials and experience. A lawyer, he is the coordinator of the Peace, Security and Rule of Law divisions within OHCHR in Colombia. He has also held roles as coordinator in various field offices for OHCHR, as well as consultancies, including with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, as well as with the UNHCR. So Felipe, participants felt that the network could strengthen and be strengthened by close connection and linkages at the national level with existing mechanisms and initiatives such as the UPR and the Sustainable Development Goals. How do you see this practically speaking? Could HRD focal points and ultimately a network of defender focal points strengthen the connection and linkages at the national level related to UN processes? And what would you see as the best way to achieve this? Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you for the invitation and for your introduction. Um, what I think, um, in the framework of the UN process like the OPR, uh, I think the focal points will be very useful to lead the monitoring process uh, about the situation of the human rights defenders in each country. Uh, with civil society, but also why not, uh, in some cases with the government. But uh, I think that Besides that, uh, the focal points, and this is relevant, uh, could give uniformity in the analysis reach of the data information that this is very important uh, because this contribute to uh, build an, uh, a position about the situation. Uh, but besides that, I think that the proposed network of uh, focal points could play a very relevant uh, role, especially in uh, UN process like the UPR. And I can see this, this importance in two levels. <clears throat> the first one, in a technical level, uh, I think uh, that the network uh, could play a key, key role, sharing information and sharing the analysis built in each country 
about the situation of human rights defenders. Mm -hmm. And this is very relevant uh, in regions like in Latin America where the source of violence are very similar among the countries. I mean, uh, the situation that the human rights defenders uh, live in Colombia is very similar in countries in Central America or in Mexico also. Uh, and this uh, share information analysis about the situation at regional level could contribute to uh, promote a regional protection and, and prevention uh, measures that the states could take no, among the governments. Uh, and also more in the process of the building of the UPR uh, reports, uh, the focal points can share experience uh, about how the governments uh, answer the questions that are part of the UPR process uh, in order to uh, prepare the position of the civil society answering the report of the government in the UPR process. I think this is very important and this will be a, a, a very strong contribution of the global uh, network. In the second level, I see that the network could play a relevant role making um, a kind of lobby with other countries in order to get a more or to promote a more critical position in other countries regarding the report provided by a government. Don't forget that the UPR is a reporting process among states. And it's important that uh, uh, the uh, network push uh, some governments to stand in a more critical positions about the uh, position of one government. As an example, if Col Colombia is next year will present the DOPR report. And it's important that other countries knows the position of the civil society and uh, could uh, get a strong position or, or critical position about that report. And how to, <clears throat> to reach that? Well, I, I think uh, it's very important to, to explore the establishment of a periodic communication process uh, among the field, uh, the focal point, pardon, uh, sorry, uh, to share information analysis. This is very important because uh, this contribute to get a more um, coordinate network and a more informed network about the situation of the human rights, human rights defenders in many countries. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Felipe. I'd now like to turn to Katerina Rose, who is the Geneva-based representative of the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. She leads Gannery's strategic and thematic work, engagement with the UN and cooperation with partners. She is also Gannery's focal point for NHRIs under threat and Gannery's representative on the subcommittee on accreditation. Katerina, NHRIs are diverse in their forms. They take many different shapes depending on the country context. What lessons can you share from the experience of networking such diverse institutions that might apply usefully in an attempt to network diverse human rights defender focal points? Yes, hello. Hello, you all. And uh, thank you so much, first of all, for hosting the discussion and also for inviting us to, to participate today. And Tess, really, I think the question you're posing speaks so much to the very essence of actually who we are. I think it's really this question around diversity. And I mean, many of you may know and will know this already, but uh, Ganri at the time under a different name was established in the early 90s. Uh, by at that time, not more of a handful of national human rights institutions. And in fact, they could not have been more diverse in who they were in terms of institutional models, in terms of institutional maturity, and of course, in terms also of national and regional contexts in which they operate and the types of human rights issues and situations that they were dealing with. And yet they really, from the very beginning, so to say, uh, agreed and acknowledged that they could better fulfill 
their domestic mandates by working together with their peers at global and regional level. And um, that is very true, obviously, still today in the form um, that we are today. Today, Ganga comprises more than 110 national human rights institutions from all world regions, from all jurisdictions and institutional models, and who obviously work on a wide range of human rights issues in at times very, very different contexts. And of course, we are immensely in, in our network and across the work that we do together, uh, coming all together under the auspices of Gandhi, we're immensely enriched and inspired by this diversity of our members and the, by, by the diversity of their experiences and the approaches that they bring to the global network um, that we are. And let me also just recall here um, and, and pause for a second um, and recall that obviously diversity and pluralism of a national human rights institution is obviously an absolutely central requirement of the Paris principles themselves, because it helps ensure that an NHRI reflects both in, uh, in its composition, but also in the way that it operates, that it works that it reflects the broader composition of society and so that it's both representative of and responsive to the community of people that it serves. And I would assume that this would be equally important for future national uh, protection mechanisms. And so, yeah, we are, as I said, immensely enriched by this diversity. And let me perhaps just share um, three points um, for the purpose of, of today's discussion. First of all, when our members come together under the global network that we are in the platform that, um, that we provide for them to meet, they really are able then to discuss and, uh, and share experiences and really collectively also reflect and identify what constitutes best practice and what does it really mean to implement the Paris Principle in practice vis-a-vis -a, -vis a specific group or vis-a-vis -a, -vis a specific situation. And um, this work and this reflecting together and, um, and listening to one another and uh, listening to those different approaches and solutions that may have been found, but also obviously the avenues uh, which this exchange opens up in terms of peer assistance and peer advice, this really helps then strengthen uh, this really helps then build strength and growth for the work of our members that which they do at the national level and of course also helps us then in promoting uh, the establishment and the strengthening of, of institutions. The second point I wanted to mention and um, I think this this is probably also Lorena, very relevant. I'm going to ask you to start to wrap up shortly as we well pass time <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, very briefly then um, is when one of our members is under attack. Uh, this is also obviously very important for us then to be able to come together as a global network, not speaking on behalf of one country or one region, but really as a global network to come to come together and uh, and support that member on the threat and on the attack and also really signify that it is not working in isolation, but really supported by this large global network. And then the final point is, is also when we come together uh, to speak collectively on behalf of national human rights institutions that we're able here also to do that based on this diversity of experiences from across all regions and different national contexts and inform here our advocacy and global policy uh, development. Thank you. Thank you so much. And please excuse the interruption earlier. Um, I would now like to turn back to Mary because Mary can't be with us, needs to leave in about 15 minutes and we want to hear from you once again. I wondered whether you could speak to us a little bit about how you see the role of the mandate in encouraging or engaging with states in the establishment of focal points. Thank you. Um, I have come to the mandate using a people-centred approach. That's how I approach the mandate. And I see uh, the mandate as being a bridge between states and defenders, and as sitting apart from civil society with a distinct voice. And the question is how best to use that voice. And this is a constant struggle for me to try and work out where is the added value 
that a rapporteur can uh, can have. Uh, of course, the mandate can encourage states uh, to listen to defenders via focal points and other points of contact. And of course, I can urge government officials to do that. And uh, also, I have decided to acknowledge publicly any positive efforts that states make in relation to human rights defenders, even though uh, you know, it just might be one or two things when there's so many more, but it, it, it's an approach I've decided on. Uh, so states should know from me, and I think they do, that the mandate is here to offer them advice on how to implement the declaration, and that the mandate is impartial. And that's very important because having come from a civil society background, um, uh, states need to know that I am... Um, you know, I'm impartial and, 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 and not an NGO stooge or something like that. So um, for, for me, if, if this, you know, if the focal points, if establishing focal points go, goes ahead and makes, makes it easier for states to implement the declaration, then I'm happy to help with that. Um, but, you know, a lot of work would need to be done in setting it up to be effective. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I'd now like to turn back to Pablo, who I understand also needs to leave shortly. Pablo, over to you. The participants in the study suggested that bringing together multi-stakeholder delegations from different countries could be a way of building collective accountability for the protection of defenders at risk and creating good practice. How can we support this? Well, um, I'm strongly agree on the need uh, to generate frequent space uh, for exchange, public and political pressure uh, to engage countries to respond uh, responsibility to, uh, to the threats against the defenders. I think it's the way uh, to, uh, uh, to push uh, the, the, the countries and the states to to answer uh, the responsibility of protect the defenders. I'm agree on the urgency to sharing experiences uh, from uh, other parts of the world and learning from uh, other situations. Uh, I think as a civil society or as a part of the governmental uh, actors, it's necessary to share experience and to see how build uh, these uh, networks and uh, sharing experiences. Trades uh, transcend borders. And uh, we have uh, uh, seen how particularly uh, environmental uh, rights defenders uh, suffer threats from uh, uh, lar large transnational companies. The defense of the defenders must uh, be transnational. As the, the document that we uh, are reading uh, and today say, the network uh, was also seen as an opportunity to raise the profile of uh, uh, protection human rights defenders as a policy area and to encourage a compliance with the declaration of highlighting good practice in the international forum. I think it is necessary to build these networks and to support the exchanges of experiences through the, the different actors. Overall, for the, the civil society actors who are pushing for a new uh, standards to, uh, to put in practice the, the new standard, international standards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. I'd now like to turn to Vincent Laurent, and I apologize that we had to switch the order a little bit to, to provide some space for Mary um, and Pablo, but Vincent Laurent is a diplomat at the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. He currently serves at the, as the, at the Peace and Human Rights Division in Bern. His main responsibilities include human rights policy in the Americas, the protection of human rights defenders, as well as promoting the right to freedoms of peaceful assembly and association. 
So Vincent, could you please comment on Switzerland's perspective of how the establishment of focal points on human rights defenders could provide a useful connection for communication and advocacy between states on the protection of defenders, including in the area of international policy making, for example, the debate around questions of the protection of human rights defenders in UN resolutions? Thank you, Tess, and uh, hello, everyone. Happy to be here on the on the panel. Um, to answer your question, the first thing um, I'd like to say is that um, Switzerland, as a state, we, we've made a, a very positive experience with uh, local coordination groups uh, that exist on the protection of uh, human rights defenders uh, in some countries. For example, in uh, Burundi, uh, where there is a very active and effective group of like-minded states working on individual cases of uh, defenders and journalists uh, at risk. So this group uh, facilitate information sharing, for example, as, as well was said, um, and they help also to uh, make a better follow-up of the various cases of defenders uh, at risk in, in these countries. They also provide a platform uh, for inviting human rights defenders to brief the diplomatic community on the situation in their country and also on the challenges they face. Another advantage of coordination groups is when it comes to taking concrete action for defenders. So not only can the groups serve uh, for burden sharing uh, among states, but they also allow for common interventions and communications. A second um, advantage I see in a, in a greater um, coordination is uh, when it comes to um, international policy making, as you, as you said. So we can look at um, the work that other uh, groups, uh, such as the Group of Friends for the Safety of Journalists, are doing in the multilateral forest. Um, for example, um, they are working on, on different uh, briefings, joint statements, um, they organize events um, in order to uh, raise awareness on certain issues linked to uh, in that case, uh, the, the situation of, uh, of journalists and the group of friends uh, also play a key role when it comes to um, the negotiation of the different resolutions um, on their topic of, of interest. And we know how, how difficult the negotiations on the resolutions um, on human rights defenders can sometimes be uh, in New York as well as in Geneva. So in that sense, a strong network of um, of focal points could could help support um, these important resolutions and and uh, also advocate for for strong language and uh, substantial elements in the in the resolution. And finally, um, as was also said, um, a network of focal points um, can help uh, coordinating UPR recommendations that are made by state by listening to the inputs of uh, human rights defenders uh, themselves and and civil society and follow up together on their implementation in various countries. Um, that being said, I think it's also important to, um, to state that there is nowadays um, a growing number of, of networks and coalitions at the international level, uh, and it's really important uh, not to, to, to duplicate what already uh, exists and to create something that is, uh, that is effective and that can achieve change on the ground. So that's something we should keep in mind during this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcel. I would now like to hand back the floor to Sukarel. Oh, before I do actually just, we've got 21 more minutes for, for this conversation. And I do want to get to a second question for all panelists. So please do try and keep your responses um, short. Sukarel, I'd love to turn back to you and also acknowledge your, your dedication. It is now 10.09 p.m. in Mongolia. So really, really do appreciate your, your participation and, and, and staying with us at such a late time there. What I'd like to ask you is about the idea that focal points ought to be multi-stakeholder. So this was born out of concern that otherwise there would be little value added in achieving change on the ground in terms of the protection of human rights defenders. From the perspective of your own work, can you elaborate on the importance of a multi-stakeholder approach that includes civil society and how this is crucial to maintaining a focus on the implementation and also increasing accountability? Um, thank you. 
Um, again, uh, I'm afraid uh, um, my input will be uh, informed by, by the, the shock situation that we have with the uh, HRD's law um, that uh, has gone out of control. Uh, and this is um, something that was not expected. We had not expected the government to manipulate this process. The government will claim that the law was drafted and passed with full participation of human rights defenders. Therefore, when speaking about uh, participation of civil society, one thought that I'm uh, thinking about is we're not, it's not participation that we should be demanding, that it should be at decision-making level, that no decisions will be made without HRDs uh, themselves uh, in, in, in the process. Um, that's one thing, if we uh, continue this discussion, having a very strong network um, is, is a great idea, but I agree that it will take a lot of time, effort, and especially resources uh, for it to, to be successful. Um, and um, again, worry about when it comes to uh, a net, these networks to be strongly influenced by countries uh, with already uh, established human rights defender policies or instruments, can these be uh, free or safe from geopolitical influence? Uh, in today's situation, when mineral rich countries uh, with HRDs seen as potential terrorists and bold action is being taken by states and large businesses to occupy decision-making space, I think we should be very careful, very careful in, in, in uh, creating uh, yet another and maybe a larger network. And unfortunately, as a defender myself, I would not likely trust a network dominated by states with major business interests in my country. So um, there, there should be many, many factors um, that we look at uh, in, in, in this process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sukhadev. Um, and yeah, we really hear that clearly, especially need for defenders to be part also of decision making and essential to decision making. I'd now like to turn back to Matt. So Matt, participants in the study mentioned the importance of complementing and strengthening existing mechanisms and mandates and expressed concern about duplicating ex efforts and inadvertently weakening mechanisms. How do you evaluate this risk? what will be the best way of ensuring complementarity and mitigating any duplicating of existing efforts? Okay, merci Tess. Uh, le risque, il est réel comme vous l'avez dit, mais c'est un risque auquel on pourrait faire face. Et uh, pour cela, uh, je voudrais faire quelques suggestions. Uh, il est important qu'on puisse avoir un objectif commun pour les actions de complémentarité qu'il y a à mener. Et euh, sur la base de cet objectif, qu'on puisse avoir une stratégie commune des actions à mener, parce qu'on sait que chaque mécanisme a son mandat spécifique. Donc, en fonction du mandat spécifique de chacun des mécanismes, qu'il y ait une stratégie euh, commune d'action qui euh, puisse être élaborée. Matt, c'est une euh, Excusez-moi. C'est bon. C'est pas bon, je pense. Ah, d'accord. C'est bon. Vous me, vous me recevez. C'est meilleur. Ouais, ouais. D'accord. Ok. Donc, je, je, je disais que euh, le risque, il est réel, mais on pourrait quand même y faire face. Et pour cela, je voudrais faire quelques suggestions. 
il serait important euh, d'avoir déjà un objectif commun pour les actions communes à mener qui seraient des actions complémentaires et qu'on puisse élaborer également une stratégie d'action commune. On sait que les différents mécanismes ont chacun un mandat spécifique. Donc, en fonction de chacun des mécanismes pourrait mener pour renforcer la protection des défenseurs des, des, des droits humains. Et euh, l'autre suggestion que je, je voudrais faire, c'est de, de pouvoir organiser des sessions périodiques euh, des sessions périodiques d'évaluation de, de ces actions qui sont menées et voir s'il y a lieu de pouvoir donner de nouvelles orientations, toujours dans l'objectif de renforcer euh, la protection des défenseurs des, des droits humains. Et euh, ça, c'est une suggestion et je voudrais terminer par une question. Nous sommes en train de parler des réseaux des, des points focaux. Il y a des mécanismes de protection qui existent dans certains pays et d'autres pays sont en train de mettre en place des mécanismes comme la Côte d'Ivoire. Euh, ma question, est-ce que les mécanismes de protection qui existent déjà ou qui sont en train d'être mis en place ne pourraient pas constituer les points focaux euh, sur la situation des défenseurs des droits humains dans, dans les pays? Merci. Thank you so much, Max, and, and thank you to the interpreters for, for dealing with that, that issue. I wanted to build on what Max said now by bringing in a question from, from the audience, and this is to, to Alice and Hannah. So we've been asked about whether the research explored how these focal points may overlap with kind of efforts that are being done on defender protection laws and protection mechanisms at the national level. Thanks, Tess. Um, we didn't look into that question specifically, but um, I think what was clear was that the positive practices and the negative practices that, that happen at the domestic level, um, and it's so important to be able to share those uh, across different countries so that uh, we don't make the same mistakes that are being repeated elsewhere. When you look at the way protection is enacted on the ground, there are certain trends that um, you know that, that actually appear in one context, uh, in different contexts quite independently. Um, and I think that if there was a mechanism to compare uh, and to bring these lessons together, we would not be repeating the same mistakes again and again. And so definitely, I, I think there is a, a positive uh, element to show off sharing the analysis and the comparisons. Thank you so much, Alice. Now I'd like to turn back to uh, Katerina. In 2018, Ganry adopted the Marrakesh Declaration in which NIH, NHRI is resolved to contribute to the establishment of national protection systems for human rights defenders who need an enabling environment which is accessible and inclusive and in which all rights are respected. This should be done in consultation with those human rights defenders and civil society, media and other non-state entities and individuals such as ethnic, indigenous and religious leaders. So do you see potential synergies and complementarities between the proposed focal points and how would you best see these streams of work tie in with each other? Yes, thank you, Tess. And it's a very important and very timely question because Ganri is actually currently in the process of developing its global action plan to follow up onto the Marrakesh Declaration. And in that process, we are now looking into reviewing what has been done since 2018 uh, what has been achieved, uh, but also uh, what are the challenges and where further work and progress needs to be done. And this work is still ongoing, but from the pre preliminary findings um, and, and the feedback also that we receive from our members and partners is that certainly national protection mechanisms will be one of the areas for further focus and work that we will be doing um, uh, under the, uh, in, in, with the support of, of Ganvi. And that will also obviously relate to the variety of aspects uh, linked up to the establishment and working of national protection mechanisms, for example, looking into the monitoring role of national institutions on human rights defender situations, looking into what role could NHRIs play both in the setup, but also as part of a future protection mechanism, gender sensitive models and gender responsive models, early warning and prevention role of NHRIs. And so really in that process, and we will be looking into sharing experiences and developing guidance and tools to support our members do that work, 
we will be looking forward to working obviously in very close coordination with partners uh, and uh, at, at all levels, at the national level, regional level and global level. And um, so it's really to create the synergies and coordination. And just the last point very quickly, I also want to just encourage um, considering the UN is currently implementing this UN guidance on civic space, which also includes one pillar focusing on protection, but it would here also be really interesting and important to coordinate with UN country presences and uh, encourage them also to, to be engaged and support. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. And thank you for, for um, responding within the time and I really, really appreciate it. I'd now like to turn back to Felipe. So the previous Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders had recommended a specific section of the UPR to be devoted to the situation of human rights defenders. Would you see it as advantageous for multi-stakeholder focal points to be tasked, for example, with monitoring the situation of defenders and feeding into a process like the UPR? Uh, well, thank you. In my, in my opinion, Mm, I think it's very important to include a chapter in the UPA report devoted to human rights uh, defenders because uh, this force to develop a systematic um, follow-up of the situation because this is a periodic report um, when the evolution of the situation uh, must be included every four years. And in this... Um, follow-up of the situation, uh, as I said in my previous interven intervention, intervention, sorry, uh, the focal points plays a relevant role uh, in the monitoring process because they can lead uh, both the gathering of information and its analysis to contribute to the report. So I think it's very, very important, both include the chapter of the human rights defenders in the UP report and that the focal points uh, have a relevant leading role in the gathering of information and analysis, analyzing the information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felipe. I now wanted to bring in a couple of questions that have been asked through the Q&A. Um, I'll hand over to Hannah to, to respond in the first instance. So a question that has been asked is, what do you think could be done by a hypothetical network in countries in which democracy is taken for granted and of course have less cases of violations against defenders? But then when they face prosecution, defenders are left virtually unprotected by their countries and supranational, supranational bodies, such as can happen in EU countries such as Hungary, Poland, or Spain. I kind of want, I'm just gonna add in another question here too that Hannah, you feel free to add into your response or, or others jump in. Was the study able to assess in how many countries would such a national focal point have a chance to function effectively or semi-effectively? versus in how many it would risk being taken over by government and not fulfill its purpose. Yeah, thank you for the questions. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I think with regard to the first question, this was something that we came up against. Um, you know, I think the backsliding is, is, is one question and I think we can particularly see it also in, yeah, in countries that were mentioned, Hungary, Poland and so on. Um, but I think also uh, what we felt was that it's important to also consider the, the kind of, you know, the well-behaved countries, let's call them, or something like this, um, in the sense that uh, what we felt with the, um, with, the, with the kind of approach would be that it would be important that each country is clear that there's a domestic focus in terms of improving the implementation. And, and it's still the case that for many countries that, uh, particularly Western countries, that, that uh, the protection of human rights defenders is something that is a, a kind of a foreign policy goal rather than a, an internal and a domestic policy goal too. And I think that shift is, is really key. And I think, okay, we see it certainly where, where we have this kind of, you know, a uh, shrinking space for civil society, and it's happening very clearly, but I think it's also important to kind of keep in mind when we're looking at countries more broadly as well. So I think I think that was something that was key and something that we kind of wanted to keep as a theme, that there's a domestic focus on behalf of all of the countries that would be involved. And then kind of leading into the, the second question uh, from Andrea, I think when we were talking about it, we felt that there's kind of a, a minimum number of countries that would be 
that would make it viable in the first instance. And we didn't we didn't necessarily put a fixed number on that, but I think it was kind of in the range of, you know, say like 10 or 12 countries that would be able to kind of come together, you know, driven ideally by a couple of countries who would take the kind of uh, the lead. I guess I guess this was still thought of as something that would be led by individual states to a certain extent and then guided maybe by a steering group of uh, of experts and 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 kind of civil society and maybe with the input of the special rapporteur and so on uh that there would be kind of yeah, a necessary minimum to get momentum i think uh i think the question where when it goes to how would it uh what would be too many to stop it being overrun by governments I think for me that comes more, and maybe maybe Alice can uh, comment as well, to the to the delegation level, right? Uh, whereas you know I wouldn't I, I think it wouldn't be something that if we saw countries that are you know engaging in good practice and so on that, that there should be a limit to how many could engage in such a network, but rather that each delegation at the national level has to have that good solid balance um, to kind of keep on track. Um, and that that isn't just a, a kind of, yeah, a nice to have, that's a, that's a necessity. Thanks. Thanks so much, Hannah. I'd now like to turn back to Vincent. Uh, some participants noted that the protection of defenders remains more or, of, or exclusively a foreign policy area. What value do you see for a state like yours in establishing a focal point on human rights defenders for purposes beyond foreign policy? For example, to also work towards progressively improving the domestic implementation of the declaration. Thank you for your question, Tess. Well, first of all, uh, uh, I wouldn't entirely agree with the fact that it's um, exclusively a foreign policy area. We, we've heard examples of several countries that have adopted national laws on the protection of, of defenders um, with the support of, of ISHR also, and other states that have um, established national protection mechanisms, such as Mexico, Colombia, or Honduras. Um, of course, we've also heard that these laws and mechanisms are, are not perfect and, and could and probably should be improved, but that's um, still a, a positive uh, development in, in my opinion. Uh, and, and then um, it's, I would also like to argue for the importance of the, of the international dimension of the, of the protection of, of defenders. So let's not forget that um, the official recognition of um, human rights defenders' work came from a, the famous UN declaration that was uh, adopted through a UN resolution and that several um, other resolutions uh, have followed uh, in Geneva and in New York with um, important um, policy elements to, uh, to strengthen the protection of, of human rights defenders uh, worldwide. After the declaration of the, um, the adoption of the declaration, um, many countries, uh, or at least several countries, uh, including Switzerland, have adopted guidelines for the protection of human rights defenders. And, and these guidelines uh, were recognized by uh, the former special rapporteur uh, as a useful tool to strengthen diplomatic support um, to human rights defenders. And I, I would also argue that we had some successes in, um, at the international level um, in protecting defenders at risk um, in other countries. Um, on the on the other hand, um, of course, uh, the domestic dimension of um, of implementing the declaration is, is important. I must say that we have this privilege in Switzerland to be um, in a situation where we we don't have um, really uh, cases of of attacks again against uh, defenders. Luckily, at least to to my knowledge. Um, doesn't mean that we uh, that we're perfect. We are uh, there are many challenges in the field of human rights in Switzerland as well, and many things we could do better. And we try to do this uh, hand in hand with uh, with the Swiss civil society, which I believe is really important, and they also provide very useful inputs when it comes to our human rights policy. And maybe um, one of the uh, added values of um, of a network uh, of focal points would be to strengthen dialogue with with uh, civil society um, uh, well among, between civil society and, and states and uh, especially in countries where it's not that much institutionalized um, at the moment and of course in states what they are 
regular attacks um, against defenders, um, such a network could also will help, um, you know, um, strengthening the implementation of, of the declaration uh, domestically. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. So we've now, we're just on 10.30, which is the time that we propose to end this event. So I'm going to propose that we that we wrap up now. I wanted to, to bring attention to some elements that had been sent through in the chat, both by Sukarel and Madeline from IFHR sharing some reports that, that dig a little deeper into some of the conversations we've had today. Um, I also wanted to thank all the, participation, all the participants for their engagement in the discussion. The diverse and critical perspectives and very honest responses have been invaluable in this conversation. Um, I'd also like to thank once again, Alice and Hannah, as well as their colleagues for all of their work in the development of this study on whether and how such a network could meaningfully contribute to the implementation of the UN Declaration in diverse national contexts. And we look forward to continued collaboration as we work together towards enhancing the protection and promotion of the rights of human rights defenders. So thank you to, to the panelists once again, um, and also thank you to all of you who have come to, to, to be part of the conversation and to, to listen into the study's findings and, and discussion by the panelists. Thanks everyone. Merci, merci beaucoup. Merci Matt, merci. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.